Welcome to the 2015 Innovation Summit Awards Ceremony. It is amazing to consider what has occurred over the last 12 months since the 2014 Innovation Summit at Space Center Houston. I have to say that being here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex has provided the best venue ever. What a place. Dinner under Atlantis on Thursday night was incredible. The innovation and know-how of the men and women of NASA is delivering benefits to humanity here on Earth. As we heard today, we'll deliver it for <clears throat> humanity for, for all time to come. We selected you as our diplomats for this pinnacle event of the annual Conrad Challenge. And of course, I'm gonna take a moment to salute all of you. You stayed the course, you did the work, you impressed the category judges to make it here to the Innovation Summit. Remember, it is an honor to be named a Conrad Diplomat. <laughs> this year, we started our program thinking we might have a university level category. We did not have enough teams to do that, but some of the university teams did stay the course. They did the work and they qualified to be Conrad Diplomats. So I want to invite all of the university level teams up to the stage for a group photo. All right, before we start, please listen up. When we are finished with the awards ceremony, we want to take our 2015 summit class photo. We will move outside to the incredible and historic Rocket Garden. We want all of you to be in this photo. Diplomats, teachers, coaches, parents, speakers, board members, everyone. So once we conclude everything, uh, please go out and head to the Rocket Garden and assemble there so that we can take our group photo. Also, those teams that are announced as winners, as Conrad scholars, can pick up their certificates at the table in the lobby. So please do that because the certificate is important evidence of the fact you are recognized as a Conrad scholar here today. In addition, you'll pick up information that will be uh, necessary for you as Conrad Scholars to receive your award this year, which is an invention assessment study from the Wisconsin Innovation Service Center. And Kaya from the WISC will be there to help you um, get the benefit of that prize. We have two times for bus returns to the Radisson. The first bus will part at 4.30. The second round of buses will leave a bit later at 6.30 so that those who want to stay and see the terrific new 3D IMAX film, Journey to Space, or to head back to the space shop can do so. And remember, don't forget to show your Conrad Challenge badge to receive 20% off on your gifts and mementos. It is now my pleasure to welcome once again, Nancy Conrad. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, if, I knew if I did this long enough, I'd become an astronaut and bald. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jack. Well, here we are, guys. Showtime. So, um, two things before we start. You know we are being live cast, right, on the web. So let's all give a shout out to mom, huh? Yo, mom! <laughs> All right, and I do want to take just a moment to explain the medallions to you, those of you who become Pete Conrad scholars. The front of the medallion is an image of Pete on the lunar surface on Apollo 12, and the back is uh, Pete's self-portrait, so do pay attention to that one. So that's what the medallion is all about. So, as Jack said, every single one of you that got here are already winners. Um, it's, it's absolutely huge that you get to an invitation to attend Summit. And even if you didn't power pitch, you still are the best of the best. And actually, this was 
the most amazing summit that we have ever had. It's the first time we've ever had an actual rap session take place <laughs> on stage. <laughs> So, so, you know, there are thousands of kids that come into the Conrad Challenge every year, and we only have about 200 that actually become diplomats. So it's a tremendous honor for us and for you, and we appreciate you taking your time to be here with us and all the hard work that you put in to get here. So, you know, sometimes I think to myself, hey, I'm just little Nancy from Denver, and, you know, I'm a teacher, and so it's very much a part of my DNA. And second, I had a huge honor and a huge privilege to be married to an extraordinary man who did extraordinary things, and we had an extraordinary life together. So when Pete would get all psyched up, he, we called each other Boris and Natasha. <laughs> and he would say, Natasha, I am all twizzled up. And I get all twizzled up listening to you and to your presentations and to your ideas and getting to know you and to know your teachers. And I mean, first and foremost, I am an educator and it thrills me to see what you are able to experience through this fantastic summit that we have put together for you. This is for you. So it's very exciting. And I do this because it's my passion. Um, I can't help it. I, you all have passion. I've seen it here. Every presentation, I see you get all excited. I see you in, interacting with each other and get all excited about ideas and things you could do. And one year, we actually had a, a merger at one of our summits. We had two teams merge, so we had our first merger and acquisition. Who knows? Maybe some of you will start getting together on your ideas that have similar uh, thrusts and ideas that you can collaborate together. It could be great fun. So here's why I get twizzled up. I get very optimistic about the future. And you are able to conceive and dream and design your own future. And it tells me that you have the right stuff. And you're creating a whole community. And that happened on day one when we did the collaborative leadership that John Williams and I hosted. And all of you became teams with people you had never met before never spoken to before, and you created innovation sitting in a table in a room. That was awesome, and that was when the ice broke and everybody in this room became part of the innovation generation, which is what I believe you are. And I don't know who's in here that's gonna go to Mars, but my guess is at least one of you, and some of the rest of you might be part of the team that designs our way to get there. And every other innovation that you've put together that is to benefit humanity, all got created through your brilliant minds and through our opportunity to give you that shot, your own moonshot. So we all know that we have to leave a better world for our children, but it's projects that are like this that also leave better children for our world. And we're very proud of you because you are the future you have tools and resources now to do extraordinary things. And for the, those of you who've come here the first time, we hope to see you again. And if you are graduating, you can go find younger students to bring them in. That's my little pitch. And just stay with us, because it's an extraordinary community of brilliant, brilliant young people and problem solvers. So. You know, education for me actually becomes mm, part of this global effort of all of you working together. And I think, you know, hey, peace could break out because of work like this, where all of you begin to know each other and appreciate each other's cultures and your stories and exchanging your stories. It's a very exciting piece of what we do together here. And, you know, being here at Kennedy Space Center this year has been so riveting for our foundation, for our team that helps us put this together. And this doesn't just happen overnight, as I'm sure you know, none of your work happened overnight. This is like, uh, you know, all of manned space flight happens right here. All the, anybody who's gone to space has gone to space as in, in this country out of Kennedy Space Center. And I feel like we're kind of in the aorta 
of the whole space program right here. And we're so much a part of the legacy of NASA and part of what we try to share with you here is that legacy of NASA, not only to honor Pete and his tradition and his legacy and in the tremendous work he did during the space program and as one of the founders of the commercialization of space, but also to give you the look and the feel and the wonderment of exploration and of the fantastic work that NASA does because it is part of your future, it's part of mankind's future. So we sort of feel like our Conrad Challenge also had its moonshot right here. This is the most amazing summit we have ever had. And I wanna share with you that when Pete and I got married, which we got married in 1990, I'm, if, in case you haven't figured it out, I'm chapter two. Um, so the first thing we did, one of the first things we did is we came here. He wanted to share with me his story and his passion for space flight, which he had all of his life. And I came here and we went up the gantry. There was a shuttle mounted there. I was terrified. And we went into a white room and put on the, all those outfits. We looked like two Oompa Loompas. And I, I caught the passion, and I hope you have caught some of the passion that is here at Kennedy Space Center. It is such an extraordinary place, and we are so very, very fortunate to be here and so appreciative of it. So I would like to once again just take a minute to thank our sponsors because that's how we get here. So of course Lockheed Martin and our dear friend Megan Campion, NASA, the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, Delaware North Parks and Resorts, Battelle Research Institute, Griffin Communications, Carter Ledyard Milburn, Sigma Xi, Project Lead the Way, the Intellectual Property Owners Education Foundation, Wisconsin Innovation Service Center, SpaceX, and Universal Space Networks. I also have to give a special thank you to Tim Ferris from NASA KSC and Theron Protzi and the entire team at Kennedy Space Visitor Complex for making us feel more than welcome. This is, we, we're home. This feels like home. And you have, all of you have gone so out of your way to ensure the success and we just bow deeply and we thank you for our hearts for that. Well, you're going to sit down only to get back up again because I want to thank some other people that have just gone way beyond. First of all, our board president, Jack Green. Jack, without you, we are without. And I call her my wing chick. For more than 20 years, Gwen Griffin and I, she's always got my back. And Gwenny, I love you dearly. Thank you so very much for all you and your team have done to make this such a success. <laughs> Kristen, Kristen, where are you? Kristen Clevin? Hey, honey, thank you. You are a rock star. And Brett, where is Brett Griffin? Yo, Brett, thank you. So, you guys have worked magic and without wands. It's amazing. I guess you have to go down the street to get a wand. Um, yeah. So, I get to introduce a special, very special individual who's our keynote speaker for this afternoon. And his name is Robert Bob Cabana. And he's the NASA astronaut who's the veteran of four space shuttle flights. He was a pilot of two and a mission commander for the other two. And for his accomplishments in space, he was inducted into as a member of the Astronaut Hall of Fame right here at Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. And fast forward a number of years, and he knows how to run the entire Kennedy Space Center. 
It's really awesome. He served as the, in the astronaut corps and went on to become the deputy director of NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. And some of you have been there with us uh, in the past years. And then the director at NASA Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. As I said, he's now at the helm here as the director of NASA Kennedy Space Center, a position he has held since 2008. Bob, please come up and let us welcome you. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on at KSC, but I got a lot of things I'd like to talk about. I, that's NASA's vision. Reach for new heights, reveal the unknown for the benefit of all humankind. And I, I think that's pretty darn cool. You know, shoot, this is different slides than what I thought I had. <laughs> Somebody changed my talk. This isn't fair. I had different slides. <laughs> I'm going to talk, you know, when I got selected to be an astronaut, one of the things you go through is media training, and uh, John Young was chief of the astronaut office. John, just an amazing guy. You know, flew Gemini, Apollo, twi tw twice Gemini, twice Apollo, twice on the uh, space shuttle, and John said, just remember, when you go out there and talk to the public, I don't care what they ask for to t you to talk about, you just tell them what you want them to hear. So I'm going to tell you what I want you to hear. Uh, and we'll talk about all this neat NASA innovation stuff. You know, you got to be underneath uh, Atlantis. Isn't that fantastic? You know, that, that was my vision for how to capture the space shuttle. And I got to tell a little story. When I was five years old, my mom and I took a train trip from Minneapolis to Baltimore, Maryland to see her sister. And while we were there, we went to Washington, D.C. Now, remember, I was only five years old. And I remember five things distinctly from going to Washington. I remember going up the steps of the U.S. Capitol into the rotunda. That's when it was open to the public. Uh, I remember climbing to the top of the Washington Monument and looking out the little window and seeing D.C. You know, I remember the Lincoln Memorial. How can you not be impressed seeing, you know, Lincoln sitting, that great big statue of Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial? I remember going to Mount Vernon and seeing George Washington's home, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, President George Washington lived here. And I remember going to the Smithsonian. And this is before the Air and Space Museum. And you walked in, and hanging from the ceiling were the Wright Flyer and the Spirit of St. Louis. And I said, I want to fly. Since I was five years old, that's all I wanted to do was fly. And, and Lindbergh's one of my heroes. I mean, flying across the Atlantic solo in 1927. He grew up in Little Falls, Minnesota, and on a farm not too different from our family farm. And they had a statue of him. We used to drive through Little Falls on the way to the family farm, and they had a statue of him in the, in the town center there, and he, what a great guy. But So, you know, seeing the spirit of St. Louis in the Wright Flyer, that motivated me to a career in aviation, in engineering, and in, in doing all that I got to do. And my hope is that today, young people will see Atlantis, and it will motivate them to a career in space exploration, in science and technology, and, and that's what it's all about. It's finding your passion. If I could give you any advice at all, do what you're passionate about. And I know you all are passionate about all this. But if you, if you do something because it's your passion, because you love it, a couple things are going to happen. First off, you're going to do well at it, all right, because it's fun. It's your passion. And work's not going to seem like work. And the other part of it is uh, you're going to succeed in whatever you do. And just follow your passion. Don't do it because you think you're going to get rich, you're going to make money. Do it because you want to do it, and you are going to be successful. And my passion was always flying and math and engineering. NASA's got a great mission. All right, come on. I pushed the right button. I swear I did. Am I in the wrong? <laughs> hey, this is the talk I thought I was given. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got a high five up there. But, uh, you know, Atlantis, Atlantis, seen it like that, it, it's truly amazing. What a, what a phenomenal program. For 30 years, uh, NASA flew the space shuttle, you know, and we would not have been able to build the International Space Station without the space shuttle. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Look at, I, you know, you look at those pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's absolutely amazing. One of my favorite is the Hubble Deep Field. 
and you know they got the mock-up over there. You can go see what it looks like, full-size scale model. But go out some dark night, look up at the, the Big Dipper. Everybody knows where the Big Dipper is. And hold your hand up there and look at your little fingernail in an area where there are no stars. And Hubble took a picture. And when you look at that picture, not only do you see thousands of stars, you see hundreds of galaxies in that area the size of your little fingernail that you know you can see nothing here on Earth. That's pretty amazing. This is Kennedy Space Center vision, and you can't read that. It says, KSC is the world's preeminent launch complex. I won't go into that. We are making KSC a 21st century spaceport that is good for both government and commercial flights to and from low Earth orbit and beyond. We have transitioned since that last shuttle flight, since the last time Atlantis flew in July of 2011, we have changed the entire face of the Kennedy Space Center, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, launch Complex uh, B, you know, is going to support the space launch system. We'll talk more about that. Uh, launch Complex A, SpaceX is modifying it, and we are moving forward into the future. These are the programs that are at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we're responsible for NASA's Launch Services Program. We provide the expendable rockets that fly NASA's science missions to space. We have the Commercial Crew Program here, and it's really a partnership. The program office is here, but it's a 50-50 partnership with the Johnson Space Center, and we have other NASA centers participating. But we are developing a commercial capability to fly crews to the uh, International Space Station on a U.S. rocket. Ground Systems and Development is transforming the Kennedy Space Center infrastructure to support the space launch system, as well as our commercial operations. And we also do uh, exploration and uh, research and technology work here at KSC and support the International Space Station. Oh, that went too fast. Just as a breakdown, you know, we are really interested in, in science and technology, STEM fields, and I am so glad that all of you are interested in technology because 60% of the NASA workforce, and here at KSC are jobs for professional engineers and scientific. You know, 24% administrative, 9% technical and medical support, 7% clerical, you can't see that. Less than 1% are uh, technicians and uh, laborers. You know, we are a high-tech uh, industry here at uh, NASA. And KSC, I've got about 7,800 uh, people that NASA money pays for, about 1,970, 2,000 civil servants and the rest contractors supporting our operations here at KSC. There's actually more than 8,000 people that work here at the Kennedy Space Center, and that's those new commercial companies that are coming in. They're adding to that overall workforce here. NASA's uh, Launch Services Program, I mentioned them. Uh, the next mission that uh, we got coming up here is going to be uh, Jason 3, and that's going to fly on a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, next year, we've got a few more flights coming up. Um, I'm trying to think of which, which really big one is on there. You know, they're all important. Uh, it's going to be a while before we send another one out to, uh, out to Mars. But, you know, this is really what it's all about. It's about exploration and exploring, advancing your knowledge and going beyond. Uh, on the International Space Station, I'm sure you all heard about Scott Kelly going up there for a year. Now, other folks have flown in space for a year. Uh, my crewmate, Sergei Krikalov, uh, we flew on STS-88 uh, together on the first space station assembly mission. Sergei uh, was on the Mir space station. Uh, he launched as a, a citizen of the Soviet Union, was up there for six months and. Uh, the Soviet Union came down and it turned into the Russian Federation. And they said, sorry, Sergey, we can't bring you home right now. And he ended up staying up there for a year <laughs> and came home as a member of the Russian Federation. But, yeah, I know, kind of interesting, isn't it? So Scott Kelly and uh, Mikhail Kornienko are going to be up there for a year. And what's really unique about this is uh, Scott has a twin brother, Mark. Uh, both Scott and Mark were NASA astronauts. Scott still is. Uh, they were test pilots in the Navy. Uh, Scott was a uh, F-14 pilot, Mark flew A-6s, and we selected them to be astronauts, and they are identical twins. Now, Mark has since left uh, the astronaut program, but he agreed to take part in the experiments that Scott is doing on orbit as far as blood draws and medical experiments and stuff. So we will have an astronaut in space for a year and then have his identical twin on the ground as truth data to make a comparison between those two. That's going to be pretty cool. I talked about... Our commercial crew program, there's two companies right now that are competing to get a service contract 
to fly crews to the International Space Station, but both companies will develop the capability and have missions to ISS prior to that final contract. And that's SpaceX with the Falcon 9 and the Dragon Rider, and Boeing with the CST-100 spacecraft on an Atlas V rocket. They will fly test flights in 2016 with the capability to fly to ISS in 2017, and that's really important. Uh, we have a great partnership on the International Space Station with our Russian partners, but we want to be flying crews on a U.S. rocket from U.S. soil, and that's going to be a big deal when that happens. We are preparing for the future to go beyond planet Earth. And, you know, NASA's been going back and forth to uh, low Earth orbit for over 50 years now. It's time to transition that to the commercial sector and focus on the really hard job of exploring beyond planet Earth. We are building a rocket that is going to take us to Mars one day, and that's the ultimate destination. The crawler transporter, we have two of these. These were built back in the 60s for... Uh, Apollo, uh, Crawler Transporter 2, we just celebrated its 50th anniversary, all right? Uh, we've totally rebuilt it for the space launch system and the heavier weights. It has uh, in bigger wheel bearings on it. It's got new jacking elevation and leveling cylinders, new generators, you name it. We went through the gearboxes, everything. This is going to be our Crawler Transporter for the next 30 years. This is going to take us to Mars. Over in the Vehicle Assembly Building, four high bays. The Apollo guys had such a vision. They had four high bays stacked for stacking up rockets to go to the moon. We utilized two of them for Apollo and two of them for the space shuttle. We only need one for SLS. We're going to take high bay three. We've already gutted it. We've taken all the shuttle platforms out of it. It's already gone through one transformation from Apollo to shuttle. Now we're transitioning from shuttle to the space launch system. Uh, and the very first platform, and when I say platform, these things are the size of buildings that we took out of there. The very first platform arrived for SLS is, and is being installed now. It came here yesterday, as a matter of fact. The mobile launcher. Uh, we are in the process of installing the systems on it to support the space launch system and the space launch system itself. This rocket initially uh, flies in 2018, September time frame is what we're shooting for. Starts out in the 70 to 90 metric ton range, involves to 125, 130 metric tons. The initial core is 27 feet diameter, just like the shuttle's external tank. When you see that stack out in front of Atlantis, picture that only bigger, all right? It utilizes shuttle main engines. We have 18 shuttle main engines, SSMEs, in storage over at the Stanis Space Center in Mississippi. All right, they are the most fuel-efficient liquid rocket engine in existence. Uh, we're going to utilize four of those for the core stage on SLS, so it'll have a liquid hydrogen engine with liquid oxygen, and then we utilize rocket boosters, solid rocket boosters, just like the shuttle. In fact, they're the same uh, casings that were used for shuttle, only instead of four segments stacked up, there are five segments stacked up. So when you look at that one-to-one -one scale model out there, think of those solids having another stack of motor on top of them, make them even bigger, and that's what this rocket is going to be. The first flight, 2018, it's going to have the Orion capsule on it, and I'll talk about more about Orion here in a little bit. So this is all happening right now. We have made great progress. The launch pad, uh, pad 39B, it's been totally redone. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, Apollo uh, 7 launched from pad 34 over Cape Side with a Saturn 1B and tested the Apollo capsule in orbit around the Earth. Apollo 8, all the, all the flights that went to the moon, launched from pad 39A, all right? And then pad 39B that we're transforming now, all the flights that launched to Skylab and uh, the Apollo Soyuz test project launched from it, and then the shuttle utilized both pads. So we're transforming pad B for SLS. It's all the shuttle infrastructure is gone. It's got a state-of-the-art lightning protection system. It's got fiber optics. All the copper wire was pulled out of it. In fact, we made $620,000 off of the scrap copper that we reinvested back into the project. That's how much copper wire they pulled out. All that, think of three miles of copper going back to the LCC. It's all fiber optics now. The propellant distribution system has been totally redone. We're redoing the environmental uh, control system, a new flame trench, a new flame deflector. We're going to Mars from this launch pad. It's going to be an awesome rocket, and we are well on the way to making it a uh, reality. The rocket itself is being uh, built and designed uh, 
by uh, Boeing and the Marshall Space Flight Center. That's where that project is. The Orion capsule is a project program over at the Johnson Space Center, and then KSC is responsible for all the ground development. We had the first flight test of Orion on December 5th last year. It flew aboard a, a Delta IV Heavy, and that's the biggest rocket that the U.S. has right now until we get uh, the space launch system. And with that rocket, we could only get it 3,600 miles away from Earth, a little over 3,100 nautical miles, all right? But that's the furthest we've been since we went to the moon. And we launched it. It went out 3,600 miles, re-entered at 85% lunar re-entry velocity to check out the thermal protection system on it, all the uh, control systems and everything, landed in the water off the coast of California, was recovered by the USS Anchorage uh, with uh, NASA folks on board helping, and uh, brought back here to the Cape. And it was a perfect mission. It flew flawlessly. All 11 parachutes deployed as planned. Uh, the uh, radiation environment wasn't quite as severe as they thought it was going to be. It, everything worked perfect. It's just absolutely great. So that was the first flight of Orion. The next flight will be without a crew on the SLS. And then the next flight of SLS, scheduled for 2021, will have a crew on board. So. You know, NASA does a lot of technology. That's what you guys were doing here, right? You were pitching technology projects that you wanted to, to win with, right? Well, we come up with a lot of technology in all areas, and spin-offs occur all the time, and we're transferring that technology. But, you know, the truth is, you know, not everything is a NASA technology. Tang was not NASA's, all right? And neither was Velcro or MRIs. But that doesn't mean we haven't come up with a lot of cool stuff, and it doesn't mean we didn't use any of this stuff. And they're in all areas. You know, NASA. NASA stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We do airplanes, too. And we've, some of the best technologies for aviation have come from NASA and NACA prior to that. Uh, recently, you know, we're looking at geared uh, turbofans that improve the efficiency of airplane engines, reduce noise, and reduce fuel. Uh, small. You can see the size of what's in that guy's hand there. A uh, cabin pressure monitor to notify the pilot very quickly of a loss in cabin pressure so they can get the plane down before uh, he loses consciousness and gets on oxygen. In uh, security, IT technology, you know, uh, it's absolutely amazing how we keep track of water on the space station, all right? And a lot of the technologies that we've developed and can use on space station, we've spread around the world. And I understand you guys had some water projects too. Um, cloud computing technologies, facilitating Earth research, you can't read all that, but bottom line is, you know, companies can, uh, countries can come and learn about uh, water and earth resources to help better improve uh, crop productions around the world. Uh, gas conversion systems reclaim fuel for industry instead of burning it off in a stack like that. Uh, remote sensing. You know, the drought in California, NASA's tracking all that. This is, a, it's like a thousand year drought out there in California. Um, in the health field, you know, algae-derived dietary ingredients nourish animals. You know, this is, instead of having to uh, use omega-3 fatty acids from fish and use fish to feed people, this technology here uh, does the same thing. And, you know, I'm sure that the medical folks have all heard about 3D uh, endoscope to boost safety when you do surgery, brain surgery and stuff. It's absolutely phenomenal. This is all NASA-derived technology. Uh, LEDs. We're using LEDs on a space station for, they're much better than incandescent bulbs, but the neat thing about LEDs is you can change colors, and uh, we found that they stimulate plant growth, and they're doing experiments with LEDs on that, as well as helping uh, sleep shifting for, uh, for crews. And this is really cool. In fact, I just learned about this the other day. There's a, a new exercise machine. Now, I haven't tried it yet, and I don't know if it really works, but apparently it does. You stand on it, and it vibrates, right? And it's supposed to uh, have your muscles react the same way as they would as if you were exercising. But this vibe chair helps in rehab for, like, athletes that uh, can't go out and exercise and need to maintain their muscle tone. They can sit in this chair, and it vibrates, and the muscles respond to the vibrations uh, much like they would after a workout to help keep their tone. So what you're doing, the technology that you guys are thinking of, you know, this is what it's all about. It's about improving our knowledge as, a, as humankind. Uh, we are going to go to Mars, you know, it, and it's not going to be easy. How many have read the book, uh, The Martian? Anybody? 
Got one or two out there. I highly recommend it, all right? It, Andy Weir wrote it. It's uh, science fiction, but uh, it is, it, you know, uh, let me do it this way. How many saw the movie Gravity? All right, what'd you think? Was it good? Yeah, it was very entertaining, but it, it was really hokey, man. You can't do that with orbital mechanics. <laughs> how, many, how many saw Interstellar? Yeah, that, that was very entertaining, and I got to admit, you know, the science fiction of black holes and that whole thing, I bought into Interstellar more than I did Gravity. That was just too far-fetched. <laughs> but there, there, was a, there was a great line in Interstellar. We weren't meant to save the planet. We were meant to leave it, all right? Now, I think we still ought to take very good care of it because I've seen it from 200 miles high, and <laughs> it, there's this thin little hazy line over this beautiful blue planet, and that's our atmosphere. That's all that's protecting us from that harmful ultraviolet radiation and extreme temperatures of space. And space is like this darkest, blackest void you can possibly imagine. And I don't see us leaving here anytime soon, so we really need to take care of it. But I think we need to be able to move beyond our uh, home planet, too, and establish a presence in our solar system and move on. And that's what it's all about. And um, if I, I highly recommend you get over and see the 3D movie Journey to Space. At the end of it, there's an animation of uh, a mission to Mars. And it's exactly what I imagined when I was uh, reading the book, The Martian. And if you haven't read The Martian, it's very entertaining and it's very plausible. It's about a, it's Robinson Crusoe on Mars. It's about an astronaut, now I won't go into the whole thing, but he gets stranded on Mars and has to survive. So uh, take time to do that. All right. I think we're getting close to handing out some awards. I, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming here. It has been a real pleasure for me to be able to host uh, the Conrad Challenge. Uh, Pete was one heck of a guy. Uh, I got to know him not as much as I would have liked. I remember, I don't know of anybody that was more enthusiastic, more innovative, and uh, just an all-around great guy. I was out at White Sands, New Mexico when he was working on the, the Delta Clipper. You know, SpaceX is working on flying a booster back and landing it vertically. Pete was working on this rocket that was like Flash Gordon. It would take off, fly to space, and come back and, and land. And they were testing it out there, and he was giving me a tour in the control room. And I, I just, you know, he is just, he couldn't stop talking. He was so enthusiastic about what he was doing. He had a passion for his work, and he excelled at it because of that. You guys, follow your passion. Uh, it's going to get you to wherever you want to go and further. Thank you. who will be named this year's Pete Conrad Scholars. Pete Conrad Scholars are the teams that scored the most points in their respective category throughout the entire competition, which began in last August. They will receive the Certificate of Recognition, the Conrad Foundation Challenge Medallion, right up here, medallion. A free market research assessment from the Wisconsin Innovation Service Center to help continue product development. Assistance with connecting with local, regional, and national media outlets. The possibility of more presentation opportunities through partner events and activities, if those are identified. And a one-year associate membership in Sigma Xi, an international inter multidisciplinary research society whose programs and activities promote the health of the scientific enterprise and honor scientific achievement. And that includes an opportunity to publish in Sigma Xi's junior research journal. A new addition to this year's awards is the power pitch competition in each challenge category. This honors the teams that gave the best six minute presentations about their in innovations in the past three days. Winners of the power pitch will receive a certificate and an impressive glass trophy, 
which you can already see from where you sit. Uh, <clears throat> There's a twist with the Power Pitch Awards. A team could become Pete Conrad scholars based on their technical scores throughout the competition, based on the work they did in the innovation portfolio. And they could also be named Power Pitch winners as well, based on the judging that went on live here. We'll see. So let's get started. Bob and Nancy, can you please come up to the stage to award our teams this year? <laughs> Michael and Talia. The podium is yours to announce our winners. As you hear your team name called, please come on stage to receive your awards, then step in front of the banner for a team photo with Nancy and Bob. My turn? Hmm? Tell you. <laughs> this year's aerospace and aviation teams developed products ranging from an asteroid capturing system, a new hybrid rocket that will allow for heavier payload, and a device designed to capture electricity off the external surface of an airplane. The team that scored the highest in the power pitch round is... Perry Pump, Aerospace and Aviation. To share with you how beautiful this is. It's hand blown glass and it's all twisted inside, which represents a team working together. So, this is really awesome stuff. Congratulations. And now the team that will assume the honors as Pete Conrad Scholars in the Aerospace and Aviation ca category for the 2015 Spirit of Innovation Challenge is... Yeah. Hang on. Oh my gosh, so easy. Space Standard is the winner. Yes? So then we'll, we'll alternate. You give the stuff when I'm speaking. Perfect. And then I'll give the stuff when I'm speaking. All right. <laughs>
Oh. Just bowing to each other. Our uh, cyber technology and security teams this year wowed us with a variety of uses for today's modern technology. Their products include a platform that allows for devices to communicate without having dedicated networks, technology to provide users with a sense of security when communicating online, and applications that provide data to medical officials to track and stop the spreadness, spreading of illness. The team that scored highest in the power pitch round is Yes, it's true. The winner is PrevTech. Congratulations, PrevTech. And now the team that will assume the honors as P. Conrad Scholars in Cyber Technology and Security category for 2015 is... Oh, I love this party. I know, huh? <laughs> it's like the Academy Awards. Academy Awards yeah, and the envelope, please. The winner is Surrey Labs. Congratulations. Developing entrepreneurs who have an understanding of how science and engineering can make the world cleaner and more efficient so it can endure through the ages is part of what makes this challenge so special. This year's finalists in the energy and environment category developed a device to reduce CO2 emissions, impervious sheets to collect rainwater in urban areas, and a system that filters water in areas near fracking. The team that scored the highest in the power pitch round is the envelope, please. Um, Safe. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more piece.
Congratulations. And now, the team that will assume the honors as Pete Conrad Scholars in Energy and Environment category for the 2000 Spirit of Innovation Challenge is I got it, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I got it. I can read, it's unbelievable. Freck boys. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> of course. That was energy in the environment. The finalists in health and nutrition category choose to focus on ways, finding ways to improve the lives and the well-being of others. The 2015 finalists developed the following health and nutrition solutions. A system that turns leaves into digestible nutrition, a system that can autonomously send medical help to those in need, a fabric built to protect firefighters for the future. This team that scored highest in the power pitch round is the envelope, please. The envelope. Nutri-Tree. Congratulations. And now the team that will assume the honors as Pete Conrad Scholars in Health and Nutrition category for the 2015 Spirit of Innovation Challenge is... Da, 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 da. Fire Armor. <laughs> Our final category is a special one. NASA is celebrating the 45th anniversary of the historic Apollo 11 moon landing. Neil Armstrong's one st small step onto the moon's surface in 1969 became the catalyst for mankind's giant leap into space exploration. To pay homage to this monumental achievement in space exploration, the Conrad Spirit of Innovation Challenge teamed with NASA to create a new category, the Giant Leap to Mars. 
Our goal, to inspire students to design creative solutions that address the issues and challenges of our next quest in space exploration, a mission to Mars. These issues and challenges include long duration space travel, health care, nutrition, and quality of life. Our finalists in this category developed armor to defend astronauts from radiation, a chamber that simulates gravity, and a system to reduce interstellar hazards. The team that scored the highest in the power pitch round is... <laughs> what? Effervesce. Congratulations. And now the team that will assume the honors as Pete Conrad's scholars in the Giant Leap to Mars category for the 2015 Spirit of Innovation Challenge is... Albatross. So every year, uh, it is my honor and pleasure, because I'm a teacher, um, to award the Nancy Conrad Teacher of the Year Award. And this year, our uh, Universal Space Network is also presenting this award with me. Um, this year's recipient has been teaching and developing science education curricula professionally for more than 20 years. He has been passionate about encouraging students at High Tech High in San Diego, California to participate in the Conrad Challenge to innovate new technologies that can solve real world needs. Please help me in expressing our gratitude for his outstanding contribution to the field of education, Dr. Don McKay. Yes. So we were talking about Charles Lindbergh a few minutes ago, and this is the sculpture that will come to High Tech High. It will reside there for a year. It is done by Eric Lindbergh, who is the grandson of Charles Lindbergh. That, along with the plaque with your name on it, which will reside at High Tech High for one year. And we are very so excited to have you guys participating with us. This is your trophy for one year. <laughs> so.
applause for everybody who's participated, who's won. Thank you, everyone.